So without further ado, thank you very much to the London School for inviting me to come back to talk to you about my journey since I uh, was here at doing the Diploma of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene 25 years ago now, would you believe. Um, it's fantastic to be back in a lecture theatre here talking to a very eclectic audience um, and also to uh, the streaming um, lecture that is going to go out to um, various organisations associated with the diploma um, far and wide. So my name is Ben Marshall and I'm now a consultant respiratory physician at the University Hospitals of Southampton on the south coast of England where I've been for the last 17 years. Um, the alumni office has invited me to come back to talk about my journey through uh, my career from the time I was here um, for three months in 1992 to the current time. Um, I've entitled the talk From Parasites to Pulmonology because uh, although the, the, talk, the course that I did here was very much right across the board of tropical medicine and hygiene, I was inspired particularly by respiratory infectious diseases, um, by what I saw on the course, and ultimately that's what led me to choose respiratory medicine as a career rather than tropical medicine and hygiene. Now the ethos of, uh, of the course here is very much encapsulated by a quote that I saw in the entrance this morning when I arrived, that the ambition of the school should be to become the spiritual home of men and women, differing in race, education and practical ambitions, but all aspiring to do their part to make the conditions of human life bearable. And that really struck a, a chord for me when I came here, because certainly when I was here 25 years ago, I was amongst um, friends and peers from all across the world, from very different cultural and educational backgrounds, and that, what, that was what, for me, made uh, the most wonderful three months of learning and inspiration um, during that time. So, as I say, I was in the class of 1992, um, so 25 years ago I did my diploma of tropical medicine and hygiene and uh, I still very proudly have my, my diploma certificate in my office in Southampton. Uh, this is a picture of probably a few years back where certainly the front walls were extremely clean and looking at the front walls at the moment I think they could uh, do with a little bit of a polish and descale. Now the director of the program uh, 25 years ago was David Maybe, who many of you know as a, a legend and an inspiration, but he was certainly very much um, hands-on with the course when I did it. He was uh, a really inspiring individual, he was a phenomenal lecturer, he was a good squash player. I remember playing him at squash a couple of times when I was on the, court and, on the course and uh, unfortunately was resoundingly beaten the times that I played against him. Uh, he's also ageless. I, I can't believe that uh, this is a recent photograph of him. He looks exactly the same character that I met 25 years ago. Lucky man. So I, I thought I'd take you uh, along a journey that actually started in 1983 when I started at medical school about two miles up the road at St Mary's Hospital Medical School in Paddington. The hospital is still there, the medical school is still there, although it's now been submerged into what is now Imperial College School of Medicine. Uh, this was a picture that uh, I was given by the Dean of the Medical School when I was a student there, which was which painted in 1983, the year I start, started. It was very poignant because uh, the two students in the picture there are very similar to the two students that sat there uh, when I first started, and uh, one of the girls in my year in 1983, I subsequently married, um, Ailsa, and she's an alumnus of St Mary's and we're both now in Southampton uh, and this was a picture that the Dean gave us on our wedding day in 1992 which was the year that I did the course here as well so I thought that was a, a pertinent picture to show but you can see in the background and this is still there the little bridge um, and then the the medical school behind and it's in one of those laboratories where Sir Alexander Fleming discovered fortuitously penicillin it was a few years before we were there I have to say so I qualified in 1988 and spent the subsequent uh, six years in postgraduate training, predominantly in London, but I did spend two years down in uh, the south coast of, of England in Southampton where ultimately I would get my consultant post. And it was in 1992 that I realised that I wanted to study infectious diseases and the infectious diseases that affect the lung particularly and so chose to 
terminate my contract with Southampton six months early, take leave of absence, unpaid leave of absence, and come and do the, the course and um, self-fund the course. And I was very fortunate in that three months to be given some opportunities to do some locum jobs at the Hospital of Tropical Diseases, which actually helped to fund the course. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that by taking leave of absence without um, having a salary during that time, it really was important for me that I made absolutely made the most of the three months there. So I'm sure many of you doing your Diploma of Tropical Medicine at the moment and subsequently will still be going through the same sort of financial hardship to fund the course. And believe you me, the 25 years since then, I've always looked back favourably and uh, um, with happiness and absolute um, resolve that it was the right thing to do for me. It taught me an awful lot. I, did, I went back to the Alexander Fleming Laboratories for a five-year period to do a PhD. Uh, this is Alexander Fleming. Um, he was working on um, bacteria, in fact Staphylococcus, and then uh, it happened, I don't know whether you know the story, but left his plates on the windowsill overlooking Prade Street for the weekend and came back on the Monday morning and saw that his Staphylococci on the plates were being uh, uh, killed by penicillium moulds that were, had landed from the streets, the not particularly streets of Paddington, um, but they created a a rather resounding ring around the penicillium mould and it was that discovery, that chance discovery that led him to the isolation of penicillin and the rest is history since then but he successfully treated before it became commercially uh, developed and, and uh, into pill form and in intravenous form he successfully treated the captain of the rifle team at St Mary's who was going to lose his sight from a staphylococcal infection with one of the isolates that he managed to produce penicillin from so it's quite a good story. Since 2000 I've been a consultant respiratory physician at Southampton and this year I was uh, awarded an associate professorship um, in medicine uh, largely through research that I've been doing in the last 17 years but also in the role I have in, in teaching. So I'm very proud of that achievement and hopefully over the next 10-15 years it will lead um, to further, further awards and developments. So in 1992 when I was here uh, in London at Keppel Street, the instance of TB, which was one of the diseases that we uh, studied in the diploma, was quite high. This is a, a chart summarising what's happened to instance of tuberculosis in the United States of America since then. So the instance in 1992 was still very high at nearly 30,000 cases a year. Since then, through developments of public health programs, particularly in very stringent controls to ensure that any new entrant to uh, arriving in America is screened for latent tuberculosis, their instance over the subsequent uh, 20 years has come down. However, progress uh, has slowed over the last four years since 2012. And, I mean, really, this slide is just to say that we can never be too confident that we have confined tuberculosis to the pages of the history books. And I think in the 1980s, America certainly, and to a certain extent, um, the United Kingdom and Europe really did think that we had uh, put tuberculosis behind us. And it was that reduction in public health funding that led to a resurgence in the late 1980s in America, the so-called U-shaped cur uh, curve of concern that Lee Reitman um, described where the instance went back up for a number of years and that was reflected in the UK about five years further down the line. So my interest was piqued in tuberculosis by coming to the course here and that led to uh, further investigations into what I could do in terms of uh, research and developing a PhD. Uh, this is a, an article that was published um, four years ago in The Lancet that shows that actually that pattern that we saw in America of instance of tuberculosis coming down has not been reflected in the developing world. As you can see in the top two graphs, the incidence of tuberculosis, all, all cases as well as HIV negative tuberculosis continues to rise, um, although the death rates have come down somewhat. So again, we cannot... Uh, afford to be too complacent with regard to both treatment and control of tuberculosis. 
And this is the latest figures from the World Health Organization that show that 90% of our global burden of tuberculosis still resides in the developing world, particularly the countries of sub-Saharan Africa. And it's a real, uh, a, a major global concern for all of us because this is a global emergency. Uh, we need to really, really galvanize thoughts about funding programs to continue treatment, funding research to continue the pursuit of a, a vaccine for tuberculosis and better quality drugs and also the vehicles to deliver those drugs as well. So in the UK we still have problems with tuberculosis but actually it's, uh, it's really put into co to context by the huge burden of disease elsewhere in the world. And the latest report from the WHO Global TB report suggests that over 10 million people fell ill from tuberculosis uh, last year. That's over 28,000 people every day, of which 1.8 million people died from tuberculosis, including 400,000 people living with HIV and TB. And there are six cases, uh, six countries in the world where 60% of tuberculosis cases occurred. Um, particularly in China, India, Indonesia, Nigeria and Pakistan as well as South Africa. 4.3 million people missed out on access to care and that's the, the major gap between what we can do for tuberculosis with a simple short course and what we're actually able to deliver on the ground. This is uh, taken out from the Public Health England's report from last year looking at the very striking differences between TB incidents, between the most deprived decile in the UK population as opposed to the least deprived. So five times the incidence of tuberculosis occurs in the most deprived decile compared to the least deprived. And that's a, an unacceptable uh, divide between the most privileged and the least privileged and that's something that I'm very keen to strike out and, and change over time. It is a simple course of treatment. It's a lot of tablets for six months but actually if you have drug sensitive disease and if you have the wherewithal to deliver that treatment to ensure patient compliance, to ensure continuity of care both with doctors and nurses, it is a relatively straightforward course of treatment to take. This is a, a pack, a blister pack of, uh, of one of our patients receiving treatment at Southampton, uh, a dosette box to help patients to remember to take their treatment every day. It also helps nurses to perform pill counts to ensure that patients are being compliant with treatment. And with that compliance, there is a 90% chance and more of, of a, a long-term cure in these patients. So we have to go back uh, over 100 years to these two gentlemen who worked on the BCG vaccine in France, in the Pasteur Institute in the north of France, in Lille, Guerin and Calmet, and they spent a number of years on the bovine uh, bacterium form of mycobacteria um, to passage it serially through a number of different cultures over many, many years to lose the virulence factors within tuberculosis and make it an attenuated live vaccine. Uh, many, many vaccines have been given since that time. It, uh, it's now lyophilized. It's part of the expanded program of immunization for TB and I believe over 2 billion vaccines have been given since then. It's probably become over attenuated in the 100 years since it was developed, but it is still effective in terms of reducing the incidence of the invasive forms of tuberculosis, namely meningeal tuberculosis and miliary tuberculosis in children. So it still has over 50% protective efficacy, and although we're not using it as part of our childhood schools program, we're still vaccinating children and from high-risk um, countries in this uh, country. And it was the inspiration for my PhD at St. Mary's, working in the laboratories um, at St. Mary's in the microbiology laboratories to develop a recombinant BCG vaccine or candidates that exploited recombinant vaccinology and allowed us to express mammalian cytokines within this live attenuated vaccine to try and boost the immunogenicity of the vaccine. 
So as you know, uh, there are a number of candidate tuberculosis vaccines, some of which are being tested in the field in phase two and three uh, clinical trials. We focused very much on the recombinant BCG vaccines at the top of this list, expressing both immunodominant antigens and cytokines. I was very lucky to be in a laboratory with, uh, again, a very multicultural, multinational group of scientists who took me under their wing for three and a half years and taught me the basics of, uh, of molecular biology, molecular immunology, and uh, molecular genetics. So it was a huge learning curve, a very steep learning curve for me, but it allowed me to gain my PhD three and a half years later, uh, and it also allowed me to publish a number of, um, of papers from my thesis, um, particularly looking at um, the enhanced antimycobacterial responses to these recombinant mycobacterium bovis vaccines. Uh, this slide shows that my candidate vaccine was able to induce a more sustained and robust uh, elaboration of interferon gamma in uh, a mouse model of tuberculosis 13 to 104 days after uh, infection with this recombinant BCG compared to a BCG lacking the vector, the uh, plasmid vector. So fast forward uh, 17 years and I've been in Southampton now as a uh, consultant in respiratory medicine leading a tuberculosis service for that time. Um, we have a much lower instance of tuberculosis in Southampton compared to hospitals in London but there are still uh, 50 to 60 cases per year of active tuberculosis and we still give treatment in fact more and more you can see from the green line on this graph we're treating latent cases uh, much, much more, and we believe that this is beginning to lead to a, a reduction in instance of active TB over the, the years that we've been actively uh, treating new entrants and also people who are contacts with active tuberculosis. And over the last year, we've established a, a small screening program as part of a national screening program to offer um, screening for latent tuberculosis to anyone who is from a highly endemic country around the world who's come to live in Southampton in the last five years. We've screened over 900 people in the last year of whom we've identified nearly 100 cases of latent disease and two cases of active disease. So it's absolutely brought the service to its knees in the last year because we've had to see and, uh, and offer treatment to these people. But it is a very worthwhile scheme and certainly seems to be leading the way across the country in terms of, uh, the, uh, of the screening program that the, uh, the country is offering. So we're very proud of that service um, and it's, it's very much one nurse who's been offered uh, a two-year contract to be able to go out to general practices to win hearts and minds, to help uh, general practitioners and uh, practice nurses to understand the rationale of identifying people who are at higher risk of tuberculosis um, and offering treatment, offering them guidance, support. Um, and information so that uh, people will take an antibiotic therapy to prevent reactivation of latent disease. So I sit in my clinic regularly on a weekly basis talking to patients who either have been newly diagnosed with active tuberculosis or who've been found to have latent tuberculosis and I often think what actually am I telling my patients and are they understanding what I'm telling them about what it means to, to be living with tuberculosis. Try and give the, the concept of this uh, latency uh, of tuberculosis. It's not as straightforward as this slide actually tells. As many of you know, there is uh, a whole spectrum of infection with tuberculosis to a very definite dormant or latent infection which will never reactivate in, during the lifetime of an individual. To those who suffer symptoms of active infection, um, some of whom will go on to die, particularly if they are left untreated. So it is this concept of a spectrum of infection which patients often find very difficult to understand. What we all have to understand is that actually latent TB infection is very common worldwide. We believe from estimates that 3 billion people live with latent disease 
of whom about 10% will reactivate at some stage during their lives, giving rise to 10 million active cases every year of tuberculosis. Let's talk a little bit further about what my roles as a doctor uh, involved doing now. I had very little idea what consultancy was all about when I arrived. I thought that I knew everything. I thought that my role was just in treating patients, uh, in looking after both inpatients and outpatients in the hospital. But over the last 17 years, I've both expanded my role, but also understood that actually the role of the consultant isn't just being the consultant practitioner. And I feel very fortunate to have such a diverse set of roles and duties because very definitely it's, it's a job that I love doing, uh, a job that I love doing even in the face of poor morale across the NHS with people working in the NHS. And it's a job I feel very privileged to be uh, undertaking and executing and, and a job that brings me into contact with all sorts of different people, both students, uh, both colleagues, both trainees, both people that are coming in thinking about whether or not they want to take on a career in medicine. So let me just try and take you through the various roles that uh, I'm lucky enough to take part in. So I left my PhD behind uh, 18 years ago now, but in our University of Southampton in the Faculty of Medicine, we have a biomedical research centre which uh, encompasses respiratory medicine and two of those themes or pillars within the respiratory medicine BRC are tuberculosis and I'm very fortunate to be included in that group and to be involved in the research programme that that group conduct. We provide uh, patients through a research clinic and samples from patients to allow the group to, to do their research and there's an awful lot of intellectual uh, sharing of information. The other pillar of the respiratory BRC is in interstitial lung diseases, particularly in a disease called pulmonary fibrosis. And so a number of uh, my, the hours of work that I do at Southampton is not just in infectious diseases, but is in managing patients with interstitial lung diseases. And again, we're very fortunate to have a very a large and successful pioneering group looking at new treatments and looking to understand the pathogenesis and pathobiology of this progressive and often fatal disease. Uh, part of my job, particularly when I'm on the wards uh, and consulting and treating patients, is to train. So we have uh, across our network and our deanery about 36 trainees who do a five to six year program of training before they become eligible to apply for consultants jobs and this is very much structured now both in terms of teaching, training out of program, experiences in research, annual review of clinical progress, appraisal and so on and so forth and so uh, that's very much integrated into our working week as consultants now is to, to actively train our juniors, to inspire them, to make sure they're on track, um, to make sure that they're developing year on year. And that actually involves quite a lot of mentoring, both formally and informally. Uh, I'm very proud to be mentoring uh, one of our Welcome Trust senior fellows at the moment who's now postdoctoral. He's a senior trainee in respiratory medicine and we're hoping that he's going to be our next professor of interstitial lung diseases. So that's been a really nice role to undertake. Whether we like it or not, we can be both positive and negative role models. We are very much in the face of the general public. Uh, we spend an awful lot of time at what we describe as the coal face, the interface between doctors on the wards and patients coming in, often with very serious illnesses. And so we are role modelling to the team that we're working with, that's the doctors, the nurses, the medical students, but we're also role modelling, again whether we like it or not, to the public, the greater public who are either coming in to see relatives who are sick or actually who are in the hospital beds themselves. So that's a, a fine line to tread, it's a privilege and it's something we often forget about but actually we should be always on our feet and, in, and performing professionally and in the way that we would like others to be seen. Um, in our hospitals. 
I've taken on a role as a uh, clinical teacher over the last 12 years, so I've given up 30% of my clinical role to devote to a program of uh, medical school training in Southampton. We have a large program of um, medical students every year, um, over 250 now, but 40 of those have already done um, a graduate degree. So they come in as graduates and have a shortened attenuated course, so four years rather than five years, of which the first two years are a very bespoke separate course from the rest of the um, undergraduate medical school degree. And I'm spending a lot of time um, during, the, during my working week with that program developing these 40 individuals who've come from very diverse backgrounds, not just from science-based degrees, but non-science-based degrees as well. And this eclectic mix of people who work together very successfully, they all come with an awful lot of life experience, and with that is a very powerful mix of, uh, of learning and experience together. And that's been a great privilege to be working with that group. We've now got our first consultants coming through from the first cohort from 2004, um, some of who are now working in Southampton. So that's really nice to actually see this, uh, this progression and development and circle of life developing. That involves both teaching and formal assessment, so I examine uh, both internally in Southampton and externally at the moment at the University of Bristol Medical School on their third year programme of medicine and science. Um, but also in postgraduate exams, so even when you've become a, a qualified doctor, as you all know, you're going to be doing a series of exams leading right up to exit exams nowadays in respiratory medicine, uh, which is the, the ultimate exam before you can uh, gain your spurs and become a consultant. Finally, there's a, there are an awful lot of management roles that a consultant has to perform, whether we like it or not. There's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of paperwork, there's an awful lot of email which just seems to go up and up and up, and it's just it's balancing that um, again within the working week as well. I will spend a few minutes talking about the multidisciplinary team in, med, in modern medicine now. Uh, by giving an example of a a technique that we perform um, in the endoscopy labs which is a relatively new technique involving endoscopy so the use of flexible endoscopy as well as ultrasound a probe an ultrasound probe that sits right at the end of the endoscope that allows us to image the structures that are just outside the walls of the bronchial tubes and it means that we are able to uh, sample the structures, particularly lymph nodes just adjacent to the bronchial tree, in a non-invasive or a relatively non-invasive way. Let's give you an example that actually five years ago, if a patient needed a staging of a tumour in, in the lung, which involved sampling the lymph nodes in the centre of the chest, that would require a general anaesthetic, an incision at the top of the neck, the insertion of a rigid tube under direct vision, and a biopsy and although the procedure was generally tolerable it was not without risk of bleeding particularly but also it required a two to three day stay in hospital. With the advent of this technique we call it EBUS or endobronchial ultrasound we can do three or four cases in an afternoon which are day cases so the patients come in they walk into the unit uh, at the beginning of the afternoon and they're able to leave accompanied by a relative at the end of the afternoon. And what's more with this technique, because we have a multidisciplinary team in, in the endoscopy suite, comprising endoscopy nurses, a histopathologist, a technician who processes the samples that we take, we actually have a diagnosis even before the patient leaves the room. You know, quite extraordinary. Uh, it's a real uh, coming together of expertise, of skills, of people working together to actually support and speed up the journey that these poor patients are going through during the investigation of suspected cancers. And it's a very fulfilling operation to do. It's not a difficult procedure. We're using a, a, a camera, we're using screens that we can see. You can see there's three computer screens there. There's the picture at the end of the endoscope. In the middle we have uh, the ultrasound images and then the computer in the background which is showing the, uh, the radiological images so we know exactly where we are in the lung. 
And as many of you know and recognise this character, Dr House, the modern hospital medical team is very different than the old-fashioned firm that I was used to as a medical student 35 years ago. The traditional medical firm with the consultant at the helm with the white coat, long white coat and all of the medical students and the junior staff trailing behind uh, at his or her whim uh, to take orders and uh, commands being barked at. That's a very different team than the we have now. We have very much a multidisciplinary team both on the wards, in the labs, in the, uh, in the endoscopy units or in outpatients. It's very multifaceted. We're very much all at the same level. There isn't that same hierarchy that there was uh, 25, 30 years ago. Thank goodness, I think the modern team is very much more equitable and we value each other each other's roles uh, in the medical team and that might include a pharmacist or a specialist nurse, an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist and so on and so forth. So I'm very proud to be part of a, uh, a multifaceted team where everybody has a role and a contribution to make. And I've talked about my role in under, under and postgraduate education. I'm very fortunate to have the position that I'm in at the moment to be able to be not just an on-the-job teacher but to have formal roles in the university at Southampton and develop, helping to develop and, uh, and teach young medical students and not so young medical students as well. That's them in action. So I thought I'd finish off just with a few slides just thinking out what I believe are the desirable ingredients for a 21st century doctor but Please feel free to add your own to the list. Uh, I often give this talk to the school students at our local grammar school in Southampton, as many of them are as aspiring uh, medical students or they want it, they're um, thinking about a career uh, as doctors or going to medical school and making that application. And I sit and, and we together decide on the list of what they believe are the ingredients of a 21st century doctor. And it's it's again it's a multifaceted set of uh, attributes um, a set of characteristics that we won't all of us have all of those but I think it's worth just taking a little bit of time out to talk about that resilience is very much top of the list I think to survive in the NHS in the 21st century is tough and I think you do have to have resilience and I say this to the uh, school students in the last year or two of of um, grammar school before they're applying that if you don't have resilience then you're not going to survive in what is effectively a, a tough environment. Next on the list and probably top of the list should be those humane qualities, the caring and compassionate attitude that you're either born with or you have to work very hard to develop and I hope that most of us who are in the healthcare profession have that innate quality that uh, you're born with and you develop and, uh, and you flourish with and you never lose and there, there is a worry and we talk about compassion fatigue and in the recent uh, inquiries in the mid-staffs particularly about this inability to, to preserve and retain that compassionate attitude. It really is, you do at times in a, a long career have to dig deep to, to offer up and continue to offer up that, those qualities and I hope we never lose them, I hope I never lose mine. Yes, a commitment to lifelong learning is very much part of many, many professions nowadays, but uh, there's none uh, of a better example than a career in medicine to continue to have that desire to continue to learn right up to the day that you retire, right up to the day, well, that you end up hanging your boots up. Uh, I think even into retirement we all continue as doctors to read our journals and to con continue to aspire to gaining knowledge. The modern doctor has to be proficient with information technology. I showed you the slide in the endoscopy suite. Those trainee doctors that are coming through now are from a generation of, um, of Nintendo, DS and game Playboy stations, play stations and things like that that actually their three-dimensional skills are far greater than mine were. I had to learn mine from scratch and so our latest generation of interventionalists uh, laparoscopic surgeons have the three-dimensional uh, brain qualities that allow them to do it with their eyes closed effectively and the future of medicine is very much in uh, computing, 
in robotics, but also even at our fingertips in the clinic rooms, we need to be proficient with running a number of different programs to look at images, to, to pick up and identify documents very quickly, to sift through large data in a very short space of time with the patient sitting in front of you. Tolerance and patience are both very good, important qualities for all of us. I think we have to be tolerant with people who are working un, uh, under our guidance uh, because it takes a long time to learn in medicine. It takes a long time to learn techniques and technologies. And I think it is an important quality to have the patience to let our new doctors, our medical students, develop those skills in their own time. And I think it takes some people longer than others, but it eventually nearly all of our, our trainees will develop those techniques and become the doctors of tomorrow, the consultants, the general practitioners of tomorrow. And it's actually through our guidance um, as trainers, as consultants, as supervisors, educational supervisors and clinical supervisors to allow those trainees to flourish. Uh, multi I watch my children multitask. They're doing their homework, they're on their phones, they're on their tablets and they're watching TV all at the same time and they still manage to learn and I think an aptitude to multitasking is again very much part and parcel of the, the, the modern day adolescent teenager and the students of the future. So I don't have any worries about uh, the future of medicine from that perspective. Uh, and again, I've alluded to this in previous slides, but I think we all need to be team players in medicine. It's team science, it's team medicine. We've got to have the ability to work with others to bring the very, very best out of every single member of a clinical team or a research team, if that's the direction that we're going through. So I'll stop, I'll stop there and take questions. Uh, it's been a great privilege to be able to speak to you all. Uh, it's also an opportunity for me to say thank you to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for giving me the opportunity to come and spend some time studying here, learning here, developing my desires to do what I am doing now in medicine and I, I wouldn't be where I was now if I hadn't had the, the opportunity to be here for that short period of time. So thank you very much. So I, at the time I was doing the DTMNH, I really thought that I was going to be an infectious disease specialist. And the job that I got as a consequence of working here and studying here allowed me to do both respiratory medicine and infectious diseases tropical medicine. And that was in a North Thames program based at St Mary's Hospital and at Northwick Park Hospital at their infectious diseases unit. So I spent the first two years with the ambition with the plan to become a, a tropical medicine infectious diseases doctor. And then came uh, a, a complete change in postgraduate education where a man called Kenneth Kalman, who was the then chief medical officer, decided that the structured program should only allow an individual to train in one specialty as well as general internal medicine. So I had to make the very difficult decision to choose one or the other. And I realised that careers at that stage in infectious diseases were few and far between. And I had to think not just of myself, but of my family at that stage. And so I chose respiratory medicine, but then chose a PhD in tuberculosis. And that was very much uh, part and parcel of what I'd gained here, that I recognised that I was fascinated by the, the subject, not just of infectious diseases, but specifically with TB. We had... Uh, a pr considerable portion of the course was on immunology of uh, diseases like tuberculosis. So I, I think the spark had been lit at that stage. The opportunity came up to work in the laboratories at St Mary's Hospital and the funding came through initially from the St Mary's Hospital Special Trustees and then ultimately the British Medical Association. 
So I, I really do look back at the DTM and H as being that trigger point that gave me uh, career ambition, uh, helped me to focus on what I wanted to do as a career. And ever since then, even though I've uh, switched allegiance to respiratory medicine, I've kept up with an interest, both a, a clinical and a research interest in infectious diseases. And until five years ago at Southampton, we didn't have an infectious diseases team. So the default position was, was me. So I looked after patients with HIV for the first 12 years of my consultant career. I still look after patients with HIV and tuberculosis co-infection. We have a very good collaboration with our and now expanding infectious diseases department. Uh, and even though I've had to take a bit of a backseat with the interesting cases of the returning traveller with a fever, uh, I still attend their multidisciplinary meeting once a week because of an, an intellectual interest. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay, so I'm an adult physician and we have paediatric infectious disease consultants who look after the children who develop TB, but the majority of cases in the UK are adults, about 5% are children, and it's about 5,500 cases a year at the moment overall, of, of which 95% are in the adult population. Uh, it's In terms of the spectrum of TB, it's not changing an awful lot still. 75% of our tuberculosis has been contracted outside the UK, so it arrives in the individual who comes to live and work in the UK in latent form and then largely is reactivated. Uh, there's a, an even split between men and women. There's, there are peaks in instance in the sort of late teens to late twenties and then later on in life where you've got an older population who, whose immune system is starting to wane or senesce and then there's a reactivation of long-standing latent TB. Uh, we see because of the European Union as it is now um, a lot of um, people who come and live over here from Eastern Europe so there's quite a high instance of Eastern European uh, tuberculosis. Uh, there are relatively stable numbers of drug resistant disease at the moment which is extraordinary because there is a huge epidemic of uh, multi-drug resistant TB in the rest of the world so we haven't seen that yet. We still have about 1% of our cases in the UK are multi-drug resistant. And then your other question was are we going to ever eradicate TB? Yes I'm sure we will but we need a decent vaccine to do so because I think TB is very difficult, as history has shown us, to truly confine to the history books. And most diseases that we have eradicated in the past have come about because of a, a decent vaccine. So I think that's the, that's the quest, that's the holy grail for the future. And I know that there are scientists here at the London School who are working towards vaccines, as there are in other uh, other units as well and I, I truly hope and believe that there will be a vaccine one of these days. Just to follow up on that, even with the advent of a vaccine, will it not be difficult to completely eradicate if we don't eradicate diseases like HIV which go along with TB? Because you might have a vaccine that works here in the UK but in Africa and other places where like, uh, HIV is common. Mm -hmm the prevalence might continue to go up and they can always come back to the UK. Yeah. So I absolutely agree with, it, with regard to that very close relationship between HIV and TB. I think you have to break break the link for, to begin with but you also have to control the disease with vaccines and the same would go for HIV as well. In the meantime we have we have very effective drugs it's just delivering those drugs and ensuring that uh, everybody is eligible to those drugs, but not just the drugs, but the actual support that re is required to look after people who need to take drugs for long periods of time. But I, I agree that uh, there is a, a very close link between HIV and TB, and without 
being able to control both diseases, I think we won't be able to harness, uh, you know, to truly confine both diseases. One more question, and this is again just for the, the career talk component. You mentioned in a couple of different parts of the conversation uh, about diversity and the importance of that within sort of the early part of your career and even within some mm -hmm. of the teams that you've worked on. Could you sort of expand on that? What do you think some of the bigger, you know, if you were giving a student now something to look for, um, you know, as they leave this school, what would, you know, what would some of those things be that, that you sort of learned along the way about that selection process? Okay. So I, I firmly believe that particularly in medicine, we need to have a diverse population of medical professionals because we're dealing with a very diverse population of patients that we're looking after. So there are a number of inroads in terms of widening access to medicine, certainly in the UK. I'll give that for an example. So that we're giving opportunities to individuals who historically might not have had an opportunity to apply successfully to go to medical school because of the very stringent requirements, entry requirements. We now have programs around the country which allow individuals from less prestigious and, and less uh, wealthy backgrounds, people from diverse backgrounds, to apply to medical schools where they do an extra foundation year and get support through a six-year program rather than the five-year program and we've had program now running in Southampton for about 15 years where about 20 to 25 to 30 students are part of what's called a BM6 program which is a widening access to medicine program so I firmly believe in providing a workforce that is fit for purpose to provide care compassion uh, to our very diverse patient population and that means in, in an international approach as well and I think there has to be a two-way uh, relationship, two-way exchanges that allow individuals coming from around the world to come and work, train, learn, gain and benefit, as well as providing the experience and the intellectual expertise to, to our programs, both in education, both in clinical science and clinical medicine. And I think we can still learn from going the other way and going and, and learning in other parts of the world too.